the past six years, Seattle University has been hosting this quarterly series called The Conversations. Had here governors and mayors, attorneys general, police chiefs, former cabinet members come to campus to engage with our students. It's a wonderful opportunity for our students to be able to be engaged in programs like this. And we encourage them who are present this evening to ask questions of our three distinguished presenters this evening. Uh, our questions will be uh, posed by Larry Hubble, the immediate past director of Seattle University's Institute of Public Service, by Joni Balter, who is a professional in residence at Seattle University, and Dr. Rashmi Cordia, assistant professor in the Institute of Public Service is also joining in the conversation to give some commentary. Unfortunately, because of coronavirus, we are delivering the program in this way. We look forward to being able to host you in Pigott Auditorium in the fall. For now, we're teaming up with Town Hall. We're glad to be able to do that, who are producing these programs or this program for this evening. Thank you very much for being here this evening. It's a, sub a wonderful subject, the promise and the peril in Seattle's new era of leadership, featuring former Seattle Police Chief Carmen Best, Seattle Public Schools Superintendent Denise Juno and Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin. I know them all three well. Carmen Best and I served on a board together and her daughter Kaylee played, uh, went to Seattle University and played on our basketball team. Seattle Public School Superintendent Denise Juno uh, welcomed her to Seattle and we had a great conversation of her Native American background that she bought, brought to the position and her coming from Montana. And uh, Senator uh, Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin is from a family that is very deep and long in its Jesuit connections and traditions. Conversation will focus and discuss on the highs and lows of women serving as leaders. Welcome again. And now let me introduce uh, David Powers, who is the Dean of Seattle University's College of Arts and Sciences. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Thank you, Father Stephen. Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to get uh, an opportunity to also join this introduction. I want to recognize uh, another leader here and, and, and recognize and honor Father Steve Sundborg in his 24th year um, as he has brought Seattle University to where it is today. Uh, has been done so many great things in his uh, tenure here as, as he is looking toward his, his, his last graduation um, and, and the many years that he's been here. I want to also recognize him as a, as a leader here in the Seattle community and, and so proud to be serving with him here at Seattle U. Uh, he mentioned uh, the, the the frame. I want to mention a little more about the conversation series. As he said, it's been uh, a seven year. Uh, we've had a presentation every quarter for the past seven years. It's been a fantastic uh, collaboration with the Institute for Public Service uh, here in the College of Arts and Sciences at Seattle University. And we've been very honored to be working directly with Town Hall, uh, particularly in, in this year uh, and so many collaborations with them over the years. So we're, we're proud to, to be connected with them. Uh, we've had opportunities to host guests from the region and beyond, as Father Steve mentioned. It's been a fantastic opportunity and we're honored to support this. The, the College of Arts and Sciences is uh, within Seattle University. You know, we provide a quality Jesuit liberal arts education uh, that allows students to think critically about the real issues facing our community and how to address them as leaders uh, in the 21st century. An event such as tonight's really reminds our students about the ways their voice and their vote have the power to impact the direction of our country. And as women leaders, the majority of our students being women at Seattle University, thinking about that leadership role is critically important. Father Steve mentioned that uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Chief Carmen Best uh, from Mayor Ginny Durkin, who I'll also mention holds the record in this series. This is her third, and we're honored to have her for her third uh, talk in the conversation series. I'm very happy to have her with us. Uh, and uh, Superintendent Denise Juno. Uh, we're honored to have all three of these speakers, uh, along with our interviewers, uh, Joni Balter, uh, Dr. Rashmi Chordia, uh, and, and Dr. Larry Hubble. Uh, we've been able to do this series, and our students are also be engaged, and uh, Dr. Chordia will introduce some students a little bit later. Uh, but it's a real honor to host these three leaders to talk about the highs and lows of women serving as leaders and serving as leaders here in the Seattle University community, sorry, in the Seattle community, which, of which Seattle University is a part, um, considering what it takes to get elected, uh, to get to roles and positions of powers, to rise through the ranks uh, as Chief Best did, uh, to, to come into positions of leadership, um, and what's needed after that in order for them to be effective and successful leaders. 
Um, you know, what, how does gender affect those roles? Uh, how are women leaders different or treated differently and what it means for our community? So we're honored to have all of you here with us. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Larry Hubble to lead the conversation. Dr. Hubble. Yes, thank you, David Bowers. Um, we're very pleased to have our panelists today here to talk about this very important topic. Let me just say a few things about the format of the presentation tonight. First, uh, Joni Balter and I will direct questions to the three panelists, and that'll be followed up by one of our fellow faculty members, Dr. Rashmi Chordia, who will ask her own questions and those of her students. And if we have time, we'll have to take some questions from the audience. Uh, we have a limited period of time, but we'll see what we can get in. Um, Joni, I guess I'll pass off it off to you for the, for the start. So can I just add one thing is that uh, the first couple of questions will be to all three of our esteemed guests. After that, we'll break into sort of more individuals so that we have time to get to the, all these important topics. So I'll thank you all so much for doing this program, for being here tonight. So we've all talked about this in our preparation for this evening. Uh, Washington State and Seattle, these are great places for women to get elected and to be appointed to top public jobs. But the burning question tonight is this, what happens next after they're elected, after they're appointed? Does being a woman carry additional burdens in your jobs? And I'll start with you, Mayor Durkin. Uh, you are the second female mayor of Seattle. We can never forget Bertha. Uh, hey, Joni, John, how are you? Good, good to see you. Add one thing before we start. I was just reminded by the Dean to, to make our standard disclaimer, which is that the views of the panelists does not necessarily reflect the views of Seattle University. Sorry. I'm signing off then. I thought I was speaking for the university. <laughs> so yeah, does does being a woman after you after you win the election, does it carry uh, additional burdens? You know, it, it, it absolutely affects it. You know, and tonight we're going to talk about both the positive and the negative, but we have to remember it would be impossible that it didn't. Um, gender discrimination is still alive and well in our country at every level of business and government and society. And so we can't expect that it would be any different when women are running for elected to office. And I think that you'll hear from the different leaders tonight that there's this expectation that everyone brings to what is a leader. And women have to straddle, I think, those expectations in a different way because we're expected both to be strong, but yet to show emotion. We're supposed to collaborate, but be decisive. Um, I think that if you look through some of those different ways that people you know, think of their leaders, women are placed in a very difficult role. And I think women leaders um, are no accepted. And I will say, I think the women who are here tonight uh, the other women I've had the opportunity to work with, we all experience at different levels that level of um, difference that's paid to us. And I think we'll explore some of that tonight. Superintendent Juno, I saw you uh, shaking yeah. your head. Oh yeah, I think that's right on. I mean, I think there are differences and you know, there are, we're st still fighting a pay gap, right? There are expectation gaps, I believe. There are scrutiny gaps, um, support gaps. I just think that there are still um, a lot of gaps that need to be addressed. We have specific organizations that are built specifically to help women get elected, for example, or to support women in leadership. Um, I believe that the leadership positions that we are still engaged in and a school district, for example, the top job as superintendent are primarily male and across the country. Um, you can look at mayors, you can look at chiefs of police, you can look at all the leadership positions that we'll be talking about tonight. And these were created by and for really men and the type of leadership that they bring um, to bear in a different ways. But I think Mayor Durkin really pointed it out well is that, you know, we are expected to be women leaders in spots that are made for men and just the support that comes along to your question of like, once you're in these positions, the support that comes along with that sometimes um, is not as present as it should be. Uh, Chief Best, are, uh, we were hoping to see your camera. There you are. I'm here. 
Uh, do you want me to repeat the question or did no, you? No, not at all. I, I have the question. I understand what you're asking. And certainly I uh, agree with both the mayor and with Superintendent Juno about their perspective on this. You know, there are separate and different challenges for women coming into these positions of authority. They're very limited. Uh, while we all celebrate diversity and, and bringing women in, uh, really it's not just enough to bring people into the, through the door. You know, you just can't bring them through the door and then leave them sitting there in the lobby. Uh, the idea is that, you know, once you bring them through the door, you help usher them through to other areas. And there are some particular challenges um, for women getting through differing expectations, different expectations, you know, or even some, um, you know, uh, biases maybe and implicit. Uh, you know, just about women and how they should behave in certain areas. I know that at the, during the time that I was police chief, there was about of the 70 major cities, I could count the number of women of color that were chiefs um, uh, on my hand. And, and, and many of them are not there anymore from Erica Shields, Renee Hall, um, Danielle Outlaw, um, uh, and two others whose names are escaping me right now, but that was it. Out of, all, out of the whole USA. So it's hard to get in, it's hard to get in the door. And then when you're there, uh, the level of support that's needed uh, to move you forward in the, in the position to be successful, uh, often, you know, you look around and you stand there by yourself. That was all I had. <laughs> oh, Larry, it's up to you next. <laughs> Can I add something real quickly to that, Joni? Just hearing what, what Chief Best and Superintendent Juno said is, I think the one thing you'll hear from all of us tonight is, is that numbers are going to matter. Um, and while the external supports aren't there, I can tell you that, that there are many times that having Chief Best in her role or having the superintendent in her role was support for me because they were experiencing many of the same things I was experiencing. So it is really important to get women in positions of leadership. This is true. And I would just I would just double down on that too. It is important to look around and see women in leadership and see representation. And I just it matters so much um, for for the next steps and for the people that come after and just to see people in roles. Um, but I do think you know the conversation that we're having right now is also super important. It's like once women get into these leadership roles, these top leadership roles. I mean, I remember moving to Seattle and talk talking to people back home about how women are in leadership roles everywhere here and how impressive that really is and how the rest of the country really should be following this model. Um, but it was a little bit surprising about once you're in these positions, um, you know, people afraid to sort of step up and raise their hand and be there behind you or with you alongside you um, when things get tough. Yeah, I'll just agree with, with both uh, the mayor and Denise on that. We do want to celebrate when we see women uh, being successful. And we certainly, as we move up, want to lift up and have that communication and connection with others, incredibly important uh, for job satisfaction and for the ability to do your work. Um, but that doesn't negate the fact that you also need to have that outside or external support um, as you're working through as well. I mean, it's true that, you know, that old statement of the old boys club, like it's very real and sort of like we need to start making our new girls club as well and try to find supports and women supporting other women once we are in these positions. Right. Yeah, I think it's clear that uh, Wash that Seattle's a great place for women to get elected or appointed to top jobs, but the burning question that we'd like, one of the things we'd like to explore tonight is what happens next? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, that's a great thing. And we've kind of talked about some of that. And I think Denise raised a good point of, you know, if you look, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at, at the gender disparities in every sector of um, society and the economy, you're gonna see the same thing and people react in many of the same ways that you see. For example, we talked about pay disparities. Um, I don't think it's any coincidence that when Denise Juno came in as a woman, she was paid less than the man she replaced. Um, and I think if I'm not mistaken, she's the man who's replacing her is going to be paid more than she did, is. And when she best spoke out against what she thought was the right thing for police funding, the response was to cut her pay. 
Um, those things are very ingrained in our society, and it's from little things to big things that I think that we have to really have a systemic look at how do we fight that. Yeah, so I, I agree, Mayor. It was incredible. It felt incredibly punitive uh, at, when when that happened, and you really, especially when we're supposed to be trying to close the pay gap and the gender gap here. And so, um, you know, those things are really important to look at. Of the, you know, thirty-seven. Of the 500 uh, CEOs of the top 500 companies, 37 are women. So we know we have a lot of work to do on this front. Um, I think there's a lot of responsibility as you ask what happens next. Mm -hmm. What happens next is we, we reach out, we speak out, we, we talk about some of the challenges so that those that come after us um, in these wonderful positions, so that we're better able to support them and have a good understanding going in so that um, we can make sure we actually do achieve equity and equality in these, in these positions. Each yeah, of you I is leaving or have already left your position as an executive. You obviously have you know, a, lot of, a lot of different reasons going uh, into that final decision, but what was the tipping point? Uh, did it have anything to do with attitudes toward race or gender? And I'll direct that to uh, Chief Best. For me, why I think you're asking why I left ultimately, you know, and, and really um, it was based on the fact it had been a long summer. To, let me just say 2020 was just a long year for me um, between the uh, mass shooting and COVID-19 and the demonstrations and the defund police and then trying to, um, you know, still maintain a, um, you know, a reasonable size uh, police force. It was quite a challenge uh, going along, but ultimately, um, you know, why people will assume it had to do something with pay and all those, it really wasn't that. It was um, having to lay off officers that we had worked uh, so very hard to bring in, uh, almost 40% diversity hiring, and um, this sudden move to, um, to have to have the first, the last in is usually the first out. There's a lot of case law and um, other rules around that. I just wasn't gonna do it. I mean, at the end of the day, that's not what I was going to be able to buy off on. And I spoke to um, both at the time, the deputy chief, Chief Diaz and the mayor. And, you know, we just had a real frank conversation. I mean, I would have loved to have stuck around and worked through some of these issues and talked about how we might do things differently. Every, every profession evolves and changes. So why would we want to have those uh, conversations, particularly uh, as an African-American woman, I thought it was very important to talk about what was going on and uh, unarmed black men being killed and what we could do about that and how we could legitimize the, the police service. Um, but not at the um, destruction of other officers, you know, people of color who we worked so hard to bring in the organization. It seemed in my view to be not well thought out um, and if, if that's the direction, uh, far be it for me to, um, you know, I will express my opinion and then it's time to move on. And that's just a, uh, you know, a fact of personal conviction uh, on that note for me. Anybody else? I'd yeah, say, I, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, would just, I would just add on, I think there's just like the pandemic and the, the reckoning with race and everything that came along with that just put a lot more pressure on leadership. And I, you know, frankly, I think the women in this room talking right now have done a phenomenal job of leading through um, the pandemic and the response to that. Um, and so I just thank them for, for the leadership that they've shown to that, but oftentimes it's still not enough. And so I think the same happened, you know, with, um, with other people, like I can look across the country too and see women leaving the superintendency right now. And just the, it's hard to run a school district on any given day, but given, you know, a pandemic and everything else that comes with that, super difficult. And then we had a change in leadership on the board and um, new people coming in. And so the new leadership added new things and we couldn't get to know each other sort of in a regular way um, that we would if we were in person as well. So it just led to a lot of frustrations and um, things like that. And so I just think that the pandemic and everything else that's going on really just led to um, a more difficult situation than, than we would have had usually. 
I would say also, Joni, I think that both the women here and myself, but women that I've worked with generally, you know, we come at service maybe from a little bit different perspective. And when we've worked so hard in our careers to get to a certain place, like Carmen Best says, there's points of integrity, but there's also this very, um, I think, truly held belief that we are, we are servant leaders. And if you can't accomplish what you're doing, if, if you have become the point of conflict, we are more likely to step out. And so I think that for me, you know, I looked at this, the year of 2020, which was the, the hardest year in the history of Seattle. Um, the pandemic was just devastating to so many families and workers and businesses. Everybody's life changed. I mean, look at, we're in Zoom instead of the auditorium. Um, then you layered on top of that, the economic impacts in the civil rights reckoning. And it was just an incredibly hard year. But those conflicts that we saw that were very personally directed against each of us in different ways, they would continue more if I was running for re-election. And the things we have to do this year are so hard that, that even the things people might agree with, they would feel they have to be oppositional because I'm the person doing them because they're either running against me or supporting an opponent. They're all gonna be viewed through the fulcrum of politics. And this year we can't afford that. So for me, the calculus was, yes, the difficulty on me and my family, which was extraordinary, but it was also the right thing for the city. Um, and at the end of the day, that was my job doing what's right for the city. Yeah, I agree. It's like, there's, comes a, there's a mission that comes with leadership. And you know, once you are in that position where it's a distraction to that mission, I just, I do, I agree with the mayor that women are more likely to make sure that the mission continues um, and that you're building a system as you go along that, you know, if, if you are not that job, you are the person who's trying to carry that out. And once that's a distraction, um, the mission has to continue. Um, beyond uh, some of the things you just cited and, and anecdotal evidence, can you, can you make any generalizations regarding how women lead differently than men? And if so, what are some of those differences? One's up. So directed, somebody want to pick that up? Uh, Eve Best? Well, certainly. I, I'm happy to ch chat about that. I mean, this is anecdotal, but certainly I think the different styles um, that people carry to um, these situations, particularly these volatile situations, uh, we want to make sure. I think women are more verbal uh, and will actually try to talk people down more, take a little more, um, you know, slower approach often. I'm not trying to, you know, say that men don't, you know, will not try to talk people down, but I think uh, you're more inclined to see more of that. Um, with women, at least in the police field. Uh, we've worked really hard uh, to try to bring that sort of more of a nurturing, de-escalating, conversational um, aspect uh, so that everybody can do that across the board. But I think it's women are more inclined in that direction. And I think when you're trying to serve people or calm people down or, you know, you know bring the temperature down, it's a lot more uh, beneficial to be very uh, moderate, even-toned, calm, uh, not, you know, less confrontational in those circumstances. So uh, that comes in many cases, and again, this is not, you know, this is anecdotal, but I think that comes a little easier to most of the women. Um, but we really try to do a lot of training in the Seattle Police Department in particular about how to emulate those responses so that you're not escalating um, any, any circumstance. So moving this along, can we lay down some of our cards here? There was some blatantly vulgar and misogynistic language on your home, Mayor Durkin, during the summer protests and the home of Seattle City Council member Deborah Juarez. The type of language, if you know what it was, was very sexualized. Mm -hmm. And it was not used uh, in a protest outside the home of a, a city council member, male, um, with a similar political position as Juarez. So what about that? Yeah, I don't think there's any question that much of the vitriol that was was directed at me was misogynistic and, and frankly homophobic. And you know, night after night we had what people would call protests, but they didn't have anything to do with Black Lives Matter because the graffiti and painted stuff they left behind was, as you said, you know, like almost the same week. I don't know if people remember, but the same week, um, uh, Congresswoman AOC. Uh, went to the well of the house and talked about being called the B word. 
Um, and there was this great uprising and, and Twitterati was like how brave it was. And yeah, we have to fight against that kind of misogynistic tone. That same week it was spray painted in multiple ways, you know, resign B and die B and, um, and people were silent about it because of, but it was clearly directed at that. And, you know, there's also, I don't think the fact that I'm the only second woman in the history of the city of Seattle being mayor and the first gay woman mayor that also spray painted was things they wanted to do to me sexually. You know, um, that doesn't happen to men. Um, and I think that the silence on that only sought to uh, further that kind of conduct and behavior rather than stop it. Joni, I think you were gonna ask a question about the, what the role the media plays in writing about covering women. Yeah, well, but okay, uh, I'll go there. I, I didn't, uh, uh, the media, okay. The media did not really cover what happened on your home or Deborah Juarez's home. And so I think a lot of people just didn't know the type of language that was used. I, th I think that's right, Joni. And I think first, you know, uh, Council Member Juarez, talk about someone who has her whole life fought for civil rights um, and has come up, it's just part of who she is. Um, and she is at her home and people are first giving the land blessing about how of stolen lands and then attacking the only native council woman member in really vile terms. Um, and it was, it was not covered in the way I think it would have been, uh, it should have been. And it wasn't denounced by her colleagues quickly enough, I think. And for me, many council members knew about it and they didn't denounce it. And the media purposely chose not to cover it until I think the sixth, seventh or eighth time. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that, but whatever the reason is, I think what it allows to happen is the dehumanization um, of people and then that allows that conduct to continue. And I think that's a really, co really bad and corrosive thing for our political environment. I think that if, if we continue the level of vitriol that we had, if we continue that kind of corrosive language, we're not gonna be able to pull together to do the really tough things we need to do in the coming months and years in this city, in this country. Do any of you, um, uh, the others of you, feel that uh, the media uh, played a role in, in, in covering this in a way that made women sort of have to put up with it? Well, Johnny, we would always hope that the media would just, um, you know, print or uh, video or whatever, the, whatever um, genre that it is simply the facts of what's happening uh, on both sides and let people come. People are smart and they're observant and they can make their own uh, decisions and conclusions. And as the mayor and both um, her and Denise have mentioned that that really did not happen. Uh, we didn't see a lot of the damage and the words that were being used on her house and certainly on Deborah Juarez's house uh, and, and things that were being said to her. Uh, so you have to question why that happened. And really one of the reasons, I mean, I'm no longer with the city or, in a, or a public servant, but one of the reasons why I think it was important to be here is because we really wanna highlight those differences so that those that come behind as we, you know, behind us, those that where we have those future conversations um, that we can get, uh, you know, a better outcome and a better result than what we saw in 2020. That's why it's really important uh, to have these conversations and to point out some of the disparity that we saw um, in the treatment of, you know, our female officials here. And again, um, you know, I don't want to, you know, sound like we don't want to celebrate their achievements. We do, but we also recognize that they had a much harder uh, road to hoe over the course of the summer. Yeah, I would just add in like, I think, um, you know, the media, uh, yeah, there's some issues there, but also just the social media, I think really plays a role in the dehumanization of leadership in general. And then just the way that, you know, somebody will read a Facebook post and that all of a sudden becomes the truth about everything, right? And that people don't peel back the layers of complexity that are there and the media also doesn't cover the layers of complexity. They're going after, you know, the headline um, that's going to help them sell uh, 
more versions. And, and I mean, there are some media outlets that actually are digging in and doing a little deeper work. And that really is where we need to get. And so like conversations like this, I think are super important to dig into um, what is happening in Seattle around women leadership and what's going to happen and how do we make sure that the next women um, that get into these roles are going to be supported in ways that, that haven't been present in the past. And so, um, yes, media and the way that they cover or don't cover. And I think just the belief in social media of whatever people see tweeted or Facebook becomes very real um, without digging past um, that initial uh, impression. Yeah. And, and Joni, I might add to that. Look, I think the, it was a really challenging year for the media too, which I try to remind myself as hard as it looks <laughs> because you know people suddenly, there weren't newsrooms anymore. And there weren't the colleagues to kind of keep each other straight. People were in Zooms. They weren't able to call out of sources. They couldn't go to scenes in the same way. And so they did over rely, I think, on social media and what was popular or popular believed. And I think if you went to various reporters and looked who they follow, so you know what's in their feed, it was yeah. very skewed. Um, and I think it tends to be a lot of it was was very sexist, frankly. And it's and it, 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 it's, it, you see that too, there's a lot of really good reporters, but we have a pretty strong base of male reporters that were covering these issues. And so you saw a lot of the adjectives that you saw, you know, with Hillary, there's- Tell us, much, tell us about adjectives. Well, I think there's, you know, it's always the major blows and, and, and it's, it's very harsh terms um, when women do things. And I think if you look at those and a perfect example, I think is, um, you know, right at the same time, one of the, publications here did a profile of uh, Governor Inslee and how he handled COVID and me, how I handled COVID. And it was Governor Inslee navigates COVID. And mine was Durkin in crisis uh, during COVID. And, and then his first line was, you know, the governor, birds are singing for the governor. And mine was, you know, Best and Durkin are under, you know, hot prices. And there was just this like- Oh, birds, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, and it's, it, but it's just where people were. But I think it's, you know, we talked a lot about implicit bias in the last year with regards to race. It is every bit as applicable with regards to gender. And people just reflect back what is present in our society. And I think it's why it's so important for us to check these things and to be honest about them. I mean, I, I talked to a, another woman superintendent in the region recently and just like how even... At public meetings, women's are judged on their looks, right? They say things that they would never say about a man about looks and how you dress and what your hair looks like and did you put makeup on? And I think that's still the same. I mean, I can go back when there were a lot of stories being written about Seattle Public Schools and just the pictures that got used by the media were so very, very different. Like I had, to, we had to call the Seattle Times and have them come take new pictures because apparently they didn't have one good one of me. And so it's those kinds of things, I think, of how women get painted in the media, the images that get used, the words that get used. And it's a really good study um, for students who are on this call to take a look of even how that perception is, is because it's sometimes subtle, but um, like images matter and how you put things out and what the stories are that get told, um, they matter to how women get viewed in leadership roles. Superintendent Juno, we have a question from the audience that I'd like to direct uh, to you. And the person asks, what advice would you give to women seeking to develop their identity as leaders? What tools do they need to develop to be successful? Yeah, I think it's, you, have to be, you need to be strong in who you are. So, you know, I'm a Native American gay woman. And so that is like a triple threat in many different ways that we could look at. And I will just say, you know, I was an elected official in the state of Montana before I came here and was the state superintendent. And that took a lot just to step up to that role. And I know that there are, these two women also can speak about being firsts, right? And there are many firsts in the room. And when I was elected there, I was the first Native woman elected to a statewide executive office anywhere in the country. I ran a race for uh, Montana's sole congressional seat where I was the first out federal candidate Montana had ever seen. Moving here, I was the first native superintendent. And so I think it really is, you need to be strong in who you are. 
You need to figure out what that identity is. You need to rely on, you need to find your people. You need to really need to find people to surround yourself with, your friends that are gonna be true to you and um, call BS on you when you need to. And, um, but, but also be there to support you um, when times get really tough. And so my advice always is to find your people, to really dig in and figure out who it is that you are, and then be true to that, that version. Um, because it's often easy to um, not be and not to include your full self when you're in leadership. And, and that is a component, I think, that when we look at women, that we also bring our full authentic selves into these roles. And that's super important. Thank you. Uh, Chief Best, uh, according to an article in the Harvard Business Review, countries with women in leadership positions have suffered six times fewer COVID confirmed deaths in countries with governments led by men. Does this glaring difference surprise you? Is this just a, is this just a coincidence or do you think there's, there's, a, uh, there's a reason for this? Well, I'm sure if Harvard wrote about it, they are, they're delving into it <laughs> and find, trying to find all the, uh, any sort of correlation between any of that. And obviously, you know, uh, correlation isn't causation, but you have to, uh, you have to acknowledge uh, the women leadership is going to be very thoughtful about the approaches um, to you know, making sure that we have safety and that we're taking care of our next and future generations. Uh, and I think they're going to be much more heavily toward the empathic role uh, in terms of making sure that people are taken care of uh, than what we've seen sometimes uh, with, uh, with others. So I, I do think there's something to that. Um, how deep it is and how far it goes, I'm sure there'll be a lot more discussion on that. But I do find that women tend to be very much compassionate folks um, and really willing to um, listen and move forward. And we've seen that time and time again. So it's not a surprise to me uh, to find that there's some disparity there um, toward women in the good on this particular case. And, and Larry, I'll, I'll add, I think Chief Best is exactly right. And I will say, even in our own region, you know, we were the first in, and there was no guidebook whatsoever. Um, and we had to create it here. And so in the early days, there were there were conference calls with the governor, the county execs of Pierce, Snow, and uh, King County, and the three mayors, Tacoma, Seattle, and Everett. And I will tell you, my two sister mayors in Tacoma and Everett, I was glad we were there because I think all of us were moms, and all of us were like, you just ripped the Band-Aid off. You know, and here's what we need to do. And it was just a very, there wasn't, for us, it was, here's what the public health guidance is. Here's what we have to do. And it's worked because of all the cities in America, even though we were first, we have the lowest incidence of disease and hospitalizations. And that didn't happen by accident. It happened because there was this strong collaborative process. And I think it helped having the, the three women mayors in the room. Not to take anything away from the leadership of the governor or the county executives. And I think it helps to have Patty Hayes as our head of our public health as well. So looking forward, um, we wanna make sure we're positive looking and forward looking here as well. Uh, I would like to ask you superintendent, if, um, if you had any mentors, um, for, you know, and this, this reflects on our students who are, are watching this evening as well. Uh, and, how did, and how did mentors affect uh, your desire to have a leadership role? Yeah, I mean, totally. And I think that all of us can probably speak to so many women that we looked up to. Um, I mean, just my grandma, you know, who walked to work every day, even in blizzards, because she was a school cook, um, just showing tenacity and caring for students. Um, my mom, who was an uh, educator and a state legislator and you know, the fierceness that she showed when she rose up on the, on the floor of the House and then the Senate. Um, Eloise Cabal, who is sort of a native heroine um, who took on the federal government for years and years and years and eventually won. I mean, there are Deborah Juarez, you know, there are native women warriors out there that just, you know, have done so much and have um, blazed the trails before. And so I always, you know, look back to see who created the path and then make sure that you're laying that ladder out so that the rest can climb up and you help them through the window. Right. And um, so, so yeah, there, there are 
of so many different pieces of advice that I think about from um, women who um, have helped shape who I am, both as a person and a leader. Um, my partner continues to inspire me every day. And so there's just a lot of women around me, um, a lot of women who came before me, but it really is when I look at Native women, um, both in the past and the present, there are just a ton that I can point to and more and more all the time, which is really heartening that Native women are taking their places in leadership roles um, that, um, and, and doing well. So just really proud of all that. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to piggyback on that uh, regarding uh, mentors. I think really it is very important to have mentors and sponsors and allies, people that you can rely on, um, male and female, that can give you good advice. You know, everything is about relationships. So you build that relationship with a mentor who can help you, who can guide you, who knows about your profession or your goal or whatever that is that they can help you with. There are allies, you know, we all have people who will come to our defense. I think Denise, you 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 stated it as know who you know who your people are, but know those folks that will you know, in your time of need or peril or when you need a support, they are there for you. Um, and they will send the letters to the editorial board. They will write things on your behalf. They'll bring the rallies in, not because you've asked them to, but because they believe in you and have confidence in you and understand the quality of your character and the integrity they, under which you operate. So that's great to have those allies as well as mentors. And then finally, I really believe in sponsorship. Um, you know, for me, you know, Kathleen O'Toole was a great sponsor, well regarded uh, around the world uh, for her leadership, the first uh, commissioner, female commissioner in Boston, the first uh, head of state patrol for the Massachusetts police, um, and, you know, well regarded in Ireland and in many places around the world. Now she comes to Seattle uh, and really helps uh, me to flourish and grow and have the confidence that I've needed. Um, so it, it does, it was a case of putting that ladder out there and pulling somebody up with you. And it can really make a difference in, um, in how you are able to land and have resiliency uh, to survive these, these really challenging positions. I think one, one more thing, I just think bouncing back off of that, it really, um, it's just building that net network of support and making sure it's there. And I think that really is, you know, the beginning question on at the beginning of this conversation was, um, People, you know, women get into these seats and then what? And that's exactly what Carmen talked about is people need to be there to block down field for you. They need to write the letters to the other. It's not just when you're in crisis, but they need to support women once they're in these leadership roles. And I think during at least this pandemic, that didn't happen often enough. And yeah, people can get scared about, you know, supporting people who may be under fire, but if they're your people, they're gonna step up and do that. And so it just goes back to make sure you have that support system. Yeah, I wanna echo that. I think mentorship is so important. And I think the, the other thing that is hard when you come through the, you know, work your way into these positions, it's hard to ask for help. And I would say to all the young women out there that remember, don't lose that skill to be able to, when you need help, let people know when you need help, because I think that's so important. Um, I was really fortunate. You know, I like Denise. My mom was a warrior. You know, she was during the war. She worked, drove jitney on the docks. As soon as the war ended, she went to Germany and ran one of the service clubs. She, you know, she was, but she raised eight kids and was out of the workforce for a long time. And then I was really fortunate. And I have to call out Governor Gregoire, who was a you know, good friend and great mentor through the years um, and led through a really difficult time in this state, you know, faced personal adversity. And as one of those people, though, but if you need help, she's right there. Uh, Mayor Durkin, uh, the leadership literature speaks a lot about how leaders transform organizations. And I wonder, to what extent as a leader did you try to transform or were you successful in transforming the culture of your organization? And if so, could you provide us some specific examples? I think the city's transformed a lot, although I think COVID stalled us out a little bit because we were in such a state of emergency, but the work we did ahead of time, you know, first, for example, we're talking about gender equity. 75% of the people who work in my office are women. Um, that's a, a diametric shift from previous mayors. My cabinet is, has significant diversity of people of color and the highest paid people in my cabinet are people of color. 
And so really transforming to have your, your organization and your government reflect your values is a really important thing. And then bringing in the ombud that we have to make sure that that goes through the whole organization itself and that we reflect our values as an organization. And then make sure that when things happen, we know what those core values are and we respond first with those values. Um, and I think we're able to do that in the times of, for, you know, when COVID hit, we transformed government overnight, how it operated from little to big. Half of our workforce or more started working from home within weeks. That's huge for government. Um, we also learned to deliver services in a different way and what services we could deliver. For example, we have a seniors program that we support a bunch of senior centers. And it's not just for the society, but it's nutrition. And we realized when we had to close those programs down, we had to stand up a hot meals program overnight. So there was, there were, and we were able to do it because we had transformed a lot of how we approached our work, that it was really about serving community and grassroots up, and it wasn't about top down. Uh, Superintendent Juno, you know, when we talked, uh, we were prepping for tonight, you mentioned that it sometimes feels like women leaders who make a decision are then subjected to extra scrutiny uh, for those decisions. How, please tell us how that might differ from the scrutiny that is applied to men who make those kinds of decisions. Yeah, I mean, I think there is a scrutiny gap. I think, you know, once women, I mean, women have to be super good to get into leadership roles. You have to be better prepared, better educated. You have to be, I mean, there's, because leadership roles are still made for, for and by males. And so for women to rise to the level, um, you have to be really good. You have to, you have to be, work hard at it and you have to be good. And so once you're there, I think that there is this expectation um, that you've, you know, you've made it there. And so then the scrutiny comes a little harder. Like I said earlier, I think there's also this idea of um, women bring their authentic selves in more than um, in, into leadership roles. And so when that authenticity is there and you're saying, like, say, for example, if people were asking questions and you said, I don't know, as a woman, people would say, yep, not doesn't know. If you are a man and you say, I don't know, then they're being authentic. And so, and, and a little bit, you know, expressing that they don't know an answer. And so I think that there is a little bit of scrutiny gap. There's a higher expectation because women are expected to be better when they um, reach those leadership roles. And I want to rip off that a little bit if I can, Joni. It's not just the scrutiny, it is also the vitriol. Um, and it's, you know, even you look at the city council and what they get in their email and the vitriol. I mean, what happened in the Capitol in Washington, D.C.? Well, shocking in many ways was not surprising to me because when President Trump tweeted against me, the level of just misogynistic and hate mail went through the roof. And if you saw in the Capitol, those people marauding through, they were saying, where is Nancy? Where is Nancy? They weren't saying, where is Chuck? You know, and, and it is, there is just a very, there's both the scrutiny and the pushback is so much stronger, I think, against women leader because of those divides we've talked about. Maybe we should just get rid of Twitter. What about that? I think that's a positive step, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to ask each of you, uh, what's your best bit of advice to young college women who plan to become high level public servants? Uh, each of you real quickly, what, what is your best bit of advice for students thinking about, I wanna do this? I'm gonna circle back to what we talked about earlier, a, a few things. One, make sure that you have the appropriate credentials and you put in the work. Uh, you don't get to cut corners uh, you know, to make your achievements. You know, ensure that you have mentors and people that you can rely on to help you, whether that's male or female or inside or outside of your particular profession, but really folks that can help you with your decision making and how you move forward. Nobody knows it all. I know that there are people out there who think that they do, but no one is successful on their own and no one knows everything. So it's really an opportunity to get to learn more and know more and through mentors. You know, you know, find people who are allies, who know you, who will support you. 
uh, and, and help you out and, and people who will sponsor you uh, when it's time to get into that graduate class or take that first uh, application for a job. All of those things matter and doing the work on the front end will help you uh, be successful uh, as you move forward and move up. Superintendent? Yeah, I think it's all of those things as well. And just making sure that, um, um, and, and, you know, I often get asked this question, particularly when I'm sitting with young people. And I just tell, tell them, like, my story has always been about walking through doors of opportunity. Like, when, every, when a door shuts, another one definitely opens. And you get to make choices at that point. And you get to choose whether you're going to walk through that door or not. My choices have always been, yes, I'm, gonna, I'm going to try that out. And sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's not so great. Um, I spoke earlier about, you know, when I was termed out of office as the state superintendent, you know, the opportunity to run for that congressional seat came up. And I walked through that door. I'm glad I did it. It was my most public failure that I've ever had. But I learned a lot from that, that experience. And, um, and so I think that there are choices that you make along the way. And you should almost always say yes to those opportunities and try it out. I think that's just so important. Um, I think there's a lot of times we talk about imposter syndrome and you may not feel you're ready. I think tr Carmen's correct. You put in the work and you get your credentials and you do all that. But once you have them, you have to really just believe in yourself and try to, even if you feel you have you're not qualified or that you have this imposter syndrome going on, you need to push through that and you need to say yes to opportunities um, and try it out. And if it doesn't work, it's, it's nothing lost, right? And so, um, because another door will open. You have to fiercely believe in yourself, fiercely believe in yourself. And I read an article somewhere that talked about how women will have, they can be 90% qualified for a job and they're still trying to get that last 10% you know, that they think is out there. And where our male counterparts uh, are just the opposite, can be 10% qualified for, for the job, but still think they can take the job and run with it uh, because you know, maybe it's a part of our culture and our society that, that allows that to be that way. But you have to be fiercely confident and positive about, you know, that you can do it. And I would never turn down an opportunity. If it's there, you walk through the door and you take it uh, and, and you run with it and, and don't be afraid to do that. Yeah, and I would just add one more thing, just what Mayor said oh, earlier yeah. about so, my position of um, ask for what you're worth. I mean, it's a tale as old as time, right? About like the pay gap where we all start and there are tons of things written about that. And um, as the mayor pointed out, you know, I still, I still make less than my predecessor did when he left. I'm going to make my next, the interim coming in is going to make $15,000 more than I make right now. And so it is like ask, and I make a good salary. So I am very pleased with where I am and I feel like I earn it every day. Um, but it's also make sure that you are paying attention to what's happening um, with your pay and ask for what you're worth and, um, and make people around you value that as well. Yeah, and Mayor Durkin, your hot tips real quick. Yeah, I would say, I'd add to a couple of things. I agree with it, what everyone said is, but I would add, remember, why do you wanna do it? Um, running for office and leadership is hard. Um, whether you're a leader in an organization, you're a political leader, it's hard to get there. And remember why you're doing it. There's a sense of mission. And so while you're in those positions, when things get hard, you have something to fall back on, which is why you're there in the first place. And I also say that I think that in very, um, one of the things that is in great shortage is courage um, and have the courage to do what is right. Um, I think that courage is in short supply many times and having that fierce sense of believing in yourself, like Carmen said, is so important. And that sense of adventure to not say no um, but it's also remember why you're there. And I think one reason women are successful is we don't see it as a flaw to actually listen and think before we decide. Um, and that's a positive. So it is, is one, now last, one last thing I'll add is mm. like when you become a woman in leadership, you support other women. I mean, my partner and I have made a commitment to help other women be successful no matter where they are. 
And there's not enough of that going around. And so when women are in leadership, support them and support the next woman who's going to step into that role as well. But women need to support. So I, I need to I need to move it along so that my um, so that the students can have a chance here. So it is time now for me to introduce Dr. Rashmi Chordia. She's an expert in the field of public sector management and justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. She is going to lead the um, the audience questions. So I have to turn off my screen so everybody looks the right size, but I'll be listening carefully. Thank you, Ms. Porter, and uh, Mayor Durkin, Chief Best, Superintendent Juno. Uh, this is such a pleasure. Thank you so much for your emphatic, experienced, and safe responses. Uh, many of our students are part of this event, and I know that we are going to continue to reflect on your responses in our classrooms. So to continue this conversation forward, Mayor Durkin, I would like to ask you, what would you say to encourage and affirm younger and aspiring public servants who have to cope with discouraging news of minority leaders continuing to face a disproportionate risk to their safety just because of who they are? It is real, it's a real question. And I know that, that it's, it is impacting leaders and it, it really deters people from running. And so I would say is be, be aware of it and be honest with yourself and take what you need for other safety precautions. Make sure you have that strong group of friends to fall back on. Know what those limitations are. But don't let it deter you because it is the worst kind of bullying. And it is, it is a kind of oppression that has been successful for generations. And we've got to turn the, we have to turn the page on that too. I mean, there are many times even I who've been in this role and have seen a lot of things have, have had concerns for the physical safety of myself and my family. And at many times you wonder whether it's worth it um, because it's one thing to put yourself on the line, but your family. But We've got to, as a society, again, pull together and say that's unacceptable because that is such a particular kind of oppression and it, and it really is part of the systemic racism that keeps the systems of oppression in place. Thank you. I want to prioritize students' questions here first. So um, I would next like to invite Ms. Adena Progenentis, who is an organizational development consultant and our Master of Public Administration student to ask her question. Ms. Progenentis, uh, her work is equity-centered and is focused on the intersection of racism and ableism in organizations. Uh, Adena, your question, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Chordia. Thank you so much to um, Mayor Durkin and Chief Best and Superintendent Juno. I'm, this has been a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate the opportunity to listen and learn from you. Um, my question is directed to Superintendent Juno, but I would absolutely welcome responses from everyone if there's time. And it is, um, what does abundant support, like truly abundant support for women of color in leadership even look like? And what are some of the essential components necessary for leaders to thrive when they're in a position of being the only? Wow, that's a great question. And that's a really hard question because it's so few, right? It's like, I was visiting with somebody today, you know, thinking about, you know, what my next steps are going to be. And he basically said, when I think of native leadership and I think of the experiences that are necessary in certain positions, I only think of you because of the firsts and this and that. And so, I mean, once you reach these sort of pinnacle areas, it's sort of like you look around and where, where, where's everybody else? And so that's why it's important to build those support systems. And so I would say abundant support. Um, sometimes I would settle for just even minimal support in a way. Um, but I think abundant support really is thinking about when you see good leadership and you see, I mean, None of us shy away from accountability. Accountability should always be present and people should always be pushing the leaders to be better leaders, to be better for the institutions, organizations that they're leading. And those often come from outside. And so the activists are good, right? And they are pushing us to think differently and be, be different. Um, but when there are leaders who are, in, who are doing good things and according to your values, you should write to them. Even just that, like just the thank you that can come when you believe in what they're doing is so important. Um, I was teasing somebody yesterday that I'd probably have three thank yous in the three years that I've been here because decisions are hard. And 
um, making leadership moves are really difficult. And so even just simple thank yous, writing letters um, to the editor of, of, you know, even just the, because people pay attention to social media, making social, social media present, um, and then invite leaders into spaces where, um, you know, if there are groups of women of color who are gathering, who want to be leaders, invite us in to, to hang out and to talk and to just figure out what the next steps for everybody are. And so I think abundant support is just being present, both um, in appreciation and also inviting into spaces to know that, there, that support is actually existing out there. Thank you. Next, um, I would like to invite our other Master of Public Administration student, Ms. Mary Jo Minoyes. Ms. Minoyes is also Seattle University's Career Engagement Specialist. Her work is focused on identities, community building, and empowering marginalized youth of color into positions of leadership and impact. Ms. Minoyes, your question, please. Thank you, Professor Choria, and thank you all for your wonderful contributions to today's conversation. My question is for Chief Best. First and foremost, thank you for your decades of service, uh, but critically from your perspective, what can future public servants do to create more humane and unbiased public safety systems? How can we reimagine the Seattle policing system to protect and most likely regain the trust of the communities that they've hurt? Thank you, that is a really good question. Uh, and one that I often think about and still am talking about literally all over the country uh, because the conversation is not just a Seattle conversation, but it's a national conversation about how are we going to move the profession forward? You know, um, how are we going to make sure that we build trust? I will say this in Seattle, there's been a lot of work uh, done on reform and reform efforts, building policies and procedures and training uh, that help uh, bolster uh, the credibility of the organization. But even with all of that, and I think all those things have been incredibly good uh, for the organization, the accountability partners coming in, the, the accountability measures, the transparency uh, of processes, um, but we still have issues. And so the reimagining piece, how we make things better is through having real and honest dialogue, having, I think the department has looked at having um, community members weigh in on policies and procedures and use of force issues going forward, being as inclusive as possible so that everyone's voice is heard. I mean, I was listening to um, Reverend Al Sharpton the other day and he was saying, you know, this whole idea that, you know, people of color don't want police is just not true. But what they really want is they want to have fair, equitable, when, when I as a person of color make a call to 911, I want to get the same response uh, that my white counterpart and neighbor gets when they make the call to 911. Or if my child is approached by an officer, I want it to be the same response and the same approach that the white kid gets when they're talked to by officers. So it's that feeling of having true equity and uh, making sure that um, we're working with communities so that they feel that Reimagining, and they and they've talked about divesting in some areas and investing in others. Uh, I would say that you know it's important that we bolster those areas where we struggle uh, with you know mental health and addiction and all of those things that really affect uh, public safety on a holistic scale. So, and I think coming together and having those conversations, and then people see that they'll be, they'll see the needle move, uh, will be incredibly helpful. Uh, so there are things that need to change and continue to change, but I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say that nothing has evolved because it, there's been a lot of movement, but there needs to be more. And I, and I, you know, I'm kicking it to the mayor because I think she would would agree with those comments um, uh, on that subject matter. Even though I know we're one question at a time, but I think it's important that she weigh in on this issue. Yeah, I, I agree with Chief Best. And look, we were at a, we were at a time in our nation's history that if we don't address these true systemic issues and the deep distrust in communities of color between all institutions, but particularly policing, then we won't move to the next level. Um, and we've got to, in, we must invest at high levels in all the, in our BIPOC communities that have been under-resourced for decades. And true community safety comes from access to educational justice, um, health care, affordable housing, economic opportunity. That's what builds the resilience uh, it's not policing and policing is there for a different role. And, and that's where we need to really be honest is that because of our systemic racist approach for generations, 
we have not done that and not in, in a fair way. And, and that's why the investment part is such a critical piece of it. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Chief Best, um, I wanted to ask you another question. Uh, you are the first of your kind minority leader in, a, in Seattle in a very masculine, very white law enforcement system. Uh, I know we talked about authentic leadership, but could you share a few more thoughts about how did you balance being your authentic self while fitting in? Yeah, sometimes, honestly, I didn't fit in. <laughs> That's just the truth of the matter. Uh, and that, that happens. And that really has been a great part of the ability to grow and learn uh, and people to understand who you are and how you operate. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, when people understand that you, you operate with integrity, you have values and you uh, hold to those values, uh, you, you end up being a much better leader. Uh, there were times that entire squads were mad at me about my position, you know, about something that happened. But I knew that I was doing the right thing and putting them in the right direction and doing what was best uh, for the circumstance at hand. That happened multiple times. And there were times that, you know, I walked in the precinct, I could, I could feel the chill. Um, but later, you know, after we worked through these scenarios uh, and, and people got better understanding, uh, we all grew from those experiences. So I, I will tell you, don't think you're just going to, you know, you don't always fit in. It just doesn't always happen. That's not my goal. And that shouldn't be any leader's goal to fit in. That's not leadership, right? Your goal is to look at the vision, look forward and see how to get people on that right path to do the right thing. And I would just like add on to that as I think also when there are people who are different, who aren't the usual kind of people that you see in spaces of leadership, it also helps to bring that organization around as well. And so, you know, being um, Chief Best, being um, authentic in herself and leading that organization helps to change and bring different conversations to that organization as well. And so it's also why it's important for women and women of color to step into leadership roles because just being who you are um, and being true to yourself when you're in that position really helps bring along the organization too. And, you know, Chief Best also got to kind of make this huge video with Macklemore, which I think was really her authentic self. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Trying not to fit in is part of being an authentic leader when you're minor, especially when you're minority leaders is what I'm hearing. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I my, with the time that I have left, I think I want to ask you this one question to all three of you. I know that public service leadership is hard work. How do you take care of yourself? How do you prioritize self-care and nourishment for yourself? I don't do it very well, but I'm trying. <laughs> I, I'm putting the effort in, you know, so I, I, do, I will, especially in this COVID-19 environment, we just are able to get to the gyms and there are a certain percentage and you're wearing the mask and whatnot, but I definitely try to get some exercise in a little, you know, and eat a little better. And, you know, I would say get some sleep, but that wouldn't be true, truly honest. I'm working all the time, but, you know, definitely think about it. And I have relationships outside of, you know, outside of just the whole police and career atmosphere so that, um, you know, it's always good to be with family. I'm a grandma, so I get to see my granddaughter and do things like that that are incredibly important to me. Um, to keep me grounded. And I think all of us will talk about, you know, our, our friendship and our families and those relationships, they help you stay grounded and, and healthy, um, you know, as you move forward in what is, can often be a very stressful environment. Uh, so I, would, I would echo that. I mean, I, look, I, I will, I did not heed my own advice. I didn't take very good care of myself and over this particular last year and a half. But part of that was not only trying to navigate being a leader of a city, but being a mom and having a family through a really difficult time as well. Um, and my youngest son was home. He had moved away, but home because of COVID. And, and I think that balancing those things is really difficult too. And I think that's true about women in the workplace. I mean, the stats are still very clear. Women provide the, you know, the primary caretaker role. Now, my partner did more of it than me, but there's still that distinguishing when you're a woman leader, often you're, you're juggling that as well. So I would say that, you know, I, I could learn from my own preaching and spend more time. And I've been really focused now on myself, but also the people who've been working in senior positions in the city of Seattle, who have just been doing tremendous work for a year and a half nonstop. I mean, the longest hours getting through these crises 
to actually force them to take time off and try to take some self time. And I think it's really important to heed that and build it in no matter how hard it is. Yeah, and I just say all the same things, ditto, 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 of um, making sure you take care of yourself. I have a colleague that constantly reminds me that, you know, you can't, and I think that's part of women leadership too, of making sure you're taking care of your team. The mayor talked about it, making sure that you are providing supports for your team who are out there making you look good every day. Um, and so making sure that you're paying attention to that, but you can't, you know, she says something like, you need to fill your own cup in order to fill the cups of others. And so you need to make sure that you are making time for yourself, that you are surrounding yourself with people who will tell you the truth, but also that you can be in spaces where you don't have to talk about work, that you don't have to talk about the challenges of leadership, that you can just be who you are. And you know, that even if they do most of the talking, but you can be in those spaces that, um, you don't have to be that person that the public knows. Again, thank well, you so much. Uh, handing it over to you, Larry. Yes, thank you, Rashmi, for those interesting questions. And, and thank you, panelists, for participating in a very stimulating discussion. Uh, although we can't hear our audience, I'm sure that they would give you major applause right now. <laughs> and uh, just thank you for being here. It was a real pleasure. And I just want to tell, tell the, um, the audience that we're going to be having one more conversation in the spring. We haven't determined who it's going to be and what the topic is going to be, but please stay tuned. And uh, thank you for uh, tuning in tonight. Thank you for having us. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Pleasure. Everyone, wear a mask, wash your hands. <laughs>